Take your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 16. We're going to get right into the message today. Luke chapter 16. And I want to preach quick. Luke chapter 16. And uh, we're going to be looking down about verse number 19 today. And I want to tell you why I'm going to preach on... First of all, I'm going to preach on this message today because I believe that God would have me to. That's where I believe the Holy Spirit of God is leading me to preach. But I also want to preach on this today because of what I've seen in... Uh, some recent, we've been getting a lot of, of uh, contact or emails, phone calls, and so forth from truckers and people across the United States. Ninety-five uh, percent of it is good response. Once in a while, we'll get an old cornhead. That's, he's all sold up, mad at the whole world and God too, but it's okay. Or some religious group that uh, doesn't know upside down from right side out, and they're all mixed up. And anyway, besides all that, but I just got another email there a while ago. I'll, I'll be reading some of the emails tonight. But uh, I had a call this week. I've not returned the call, but I'm going to. I'm going to help the guy out. But back in Virginia, a man called, and he had went to a Bible study. People invited him to and thought it was supposed to be kind of a fundamental you know, Bible-believing group. And he got in there and found out that they do not believe hell is a conscious place of torment. They just believe that you go to hell and you just burn up and that's it. It's all over with. Now, I want to preach this morning on the subject of hell. In fact, I want to preach on a message entitled, What the Rich Man Saw in Hell. And I want you to read with me Luke chapter 16, verse number 19. Now, I usually preach through the, through the Bible, or through books at least. And those of you in here this morning, I had a phone call from a man this morning who needs prayer. He's a pastor. Uh, he had a ladies' group in his church. They have a meeting every week. They have ladies' night out. And the song leader of the church was invited to the ladies' group to wear, wear, come in drag dress. Wore a dress to a ladies' group meeting. This pastor's having to deal with this stuff. And he needs prayer. I'm going to tell you, we're in a sick mess. I'll tell you what, you ladies don't have time for a ladies' meeting during the week. What you need to be doing is staying home with your husband and your wife and your children and taking care of your family. These old gossip sessions ain't nothing but a hellhole situation for a defilement. And I'm saying this to you, that I never heard such nonsense in my life. Then they want to put up those pictures of him in a drag dress in the church foyer on the bulletin board. And I'll tell you, that's sick, amen? This pastor's heart is grieved. He's, and, but uh, I'll tell you, we're in a mess in this country. But this, uh, this man uh, called this week, and I began to think of it. He wanted scriptures to do with the fact that hell is a, is a place of consciousness, that you don't just burn up and quit existing. And I haven't preached on hell in quite a while. You know, those of you here know that I do preach salvation. I believe in evangelism. Any church that's not involved in evangelism is a dead church. But after evangelism, then we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to build our homes up specially. And I want to encourage that you that are men here today, lead your homes in the, in the ways of the Lord. I want to encourage you ladies, get with your husband and be that submissive wife that you ought to be, and godly wife, and help me that God made you to be. And then raise your children for the grace and the glory of, through, by the grace and for the glory of God. And but this morning, I want to address this subject, and uh, not only with the idea that uh, we need it. But you know, I need to hear about hell as a Christian, so that I don't lose my burden for the lost. Well, let me tell you something. Everybody that died this week in the world either went to heaven or went to hell. Everybody under the sound of my voice, you're going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. There's no in-between place. The Catholic Church lie to you, tell you there's a purgatory. That's not true. That's not in the Bible. And uh, the, Je- the Jehovah Witnesses tell you there ain't no hell. They're lying to you. The Seventh-day Adventists tell you that you just burn up like a matchstick. They're lying to you. You better believe this book. You better believe this Bible. There is a place called hell. Now, let's read the passage of Scripture. The Bible says in verse number 19, there was a certain rich man. Now, if you don't have a Bible, read on with somebody that does. You read the Bible which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at, the gate, at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Now, here's my text, verse number 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, 
and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send them to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come unto this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will do what? Repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. I want you to take your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and then we're going to pray, and by God's help, preach quickly this morning, and let the Lord do the work that He wants to do. Chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, beginning at verse number 3. The Bible said this, if you don't have a Bible and you're not reading the Bible, I want you to listen to me very carefully. I'm going to read the Word of God. But if our gospel, now the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in your place for your sins, that He died, was buried, and rose again the third day. And through His name, and through His blood, and through His sacrifice, you can be saved and forgiven, uh, delivered from the wrath to come, not go to hell, but go to heaven, by faith in Jesus Christ, receiving Him as your Savior. It said, but if our gospel be hid, in other words, God said that the gospel can be hid from people, and brother, it is being hid from people. It said it is hid to, the, hid to them that are lost. You're either saved here today, or you're lost. You're not somewhere in the middle. Then it said this in verse number 4, In whom, now the in whom there is the people that have the gospel hid from them. They don't see it. In whom the God of this world, that's talking about Satan, little g, hath done something. He hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Beloved, if you ever see the gospel if you ever see salvation, if you ever see heaven, it will be in the light of the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. But this passage of Scripture relates to Luke chapter 16 because the Bible records that as quick as that man got to hell, he saw some things. And I want you to pray with me this morning that God will open our eyes as Christians to make us see that people around us every day are dying and going to hell. I want to tell you something. It's not just here in church. And it's not just at Camp Joy. What I want to ask you, saved man and saved woman, do you have the same burden for people that you meet day by day that you do here at church or that you did at camp or that you do at Bible school or that you do at the revival meeting? How deep is your burden for people and how cosmic or how aware of you that people are dying and going to hell around you every day? And what does it really mean to you to understand that your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors are dying and going to hell? And if they're lost and are not saved, they will go to hell. And those of you that are here this morning that are lost, I don't care whether you claim to be as religious as a billy goat, and I don't care what your conservative politics are. You're, that doesn't make you a saved man. And if you're not born again, I want you to understand that you're, if you don't get saved, you're going to go to a place called hell. And it's not a joke, and it's not a preacher's uh, 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 tormenting situation. It is a real place. I want you to pray that God would open the eyes of us that are saved, that we'll get a burden, that we'll really believe hell, and we'll, we'll live like we believe there's a hell, and that we'll have the boldness to warn people about hell. I want you to pray that God will open the eyes of the lost here. This morning, I want to say something to you before I pray. If you ever for a split second realize the, the criticalness and the realness of hell, you would not wait for me to get done preaching to get saved. You would bow your head or fall on your face. You'd crawl out through the rocks on that driveway begging God to save you if you really knew what hell was like. But the truth about it is this morning, the reason you haven't thought about hell in six years 
is because the devil has got your mind blinded by a bunch of junk. He's got you worried about what you're wearing, what you look like, where you're going, how much money you're making and all that garbage. And you're not thinking on hell because you're blinded by the devil. And my prayer today is this. Is that God will open your eyes and make you to see your lost condition and where you can be in the beat of a heart. Lord, help us today to preach with power of the Holy Ghost. I pray God today help us to preach if we'd never get to preach again. Because, Lord, the truth of it is there'll be a day when I step behind this pulpit the last time. Lord, I'll open my mouth the last time and warn somebody to be saved. Somebody to repent of their sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I want to ask you something special today. I'm going to ask you to save people in this service right now today. God, I don't want some shallow little old temporarily afraid to go to hell deal, Lord. I want some, God, I want them to realize they need to repent, that they've sinned against God, that they're worthy of the wrath of God and the judgment of God against them and eternal separation of the lake of fire because of their sin against the holy God. I pray, God, today that they'll quit comparing themselves to other people, whether good or bad. And I pray, God, they'll see themselves standing before you and realize that it's appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. God, Please, I beg in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would open the eyes of the blind and the lost here today. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll convert them to Jesus Christ, bring them under conviction of sin. And I pray, God, repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. And God, save them so, Lord, that they'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And Lord, I pray. I pray that you'll block the devil from lying to people while I'm preaching. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to say, first of all, this morning, in verse number 23, it said, In hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth. And the Bible to preach on that thing, that he lifted up his eyes, and he began to see some things that he never saw before. The first thing I want you to realize this morning, that he saw the reality of hell. I want to tell you something, there's about 81% of American people, listen to me this morning, in churches that do not believe there's a literal, eternal, burning hell where they will spend eternity at. Isn't that sick? Did you know this morning you can listen to your average TV preacher, and I'll challenge you this morning, when's the last time you've ever heard somebody preach on hell over the radio, over the TV? Preachers in America are no longer preaching on hell, and Christians aren't living like they really believe there's a hell this morning. I'm saying the first thing he realized that it was a reality. I want you to imagine with me this morning, this, I don't know whether he had cancer, I don't know whether he had a heart attack, I don't know whether he got run over by a chariot. I don't know whether he fell off in a drunken stupor. But the Bible said the rich man died, was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. I want to tell you something this morning. I want to ask you a question. Do you really believe there's a hell or do you believe God's lying? The Bible said let God be true and every man a liar. There is a reality in hell. There is a reality in hell. You may not believe in hell this morning. But I promise you the first second you pop into hell, I promise you that you will believe in hell like he did. And you'll see that it was real. You see, before he died, he couldn't see it. He didn't understand it. He didn't believe it. But when he died, he realized the reality and it was in hell. Secondly, this morning I want to say this, that he saw how suddenly a man can be in hell. When I was in Texas working back the first year, Karen and I ever got married down there, we'll forget this. There's two boys brought in a load of, load of logs to a sawmill down there. Got out of their truck, waiting in line to unload their logs. They walked up there and stood at the edge of that building. Two young men, one 19, one 21 years old. They stand standing there and a the cable snapped on that uh, uh, sawmill. Went through the air. Nobody even saw it. It cut one of them boys in two. From his, he cut, cut his head off and cut it right down through here. He just fell in the pool of blood in the floor. The other boy cut him underneath his arm right here and right down about his waist. Didn't cut him into it. Killed them both instantly. Two 19 and 21 year old boys. Stop logging boys and instantly into eternity. And I'm going to say this to you this morning. If they were not saved, oh, they were in hell that fast. I told you about a young man the other day that I grew up with down here south of town. As far as I know, he was never saved. Family never saved. He was in pornography. He brought his pornography on a school bus with him. My daddy, and he was sleeping in bed one night. And the Bible, and, and the, he was sleeping in bed one night. And the gas got in the fumes of that house. And it killed all the family. And I'm going to tell you something this morning. You listen to me. He never raised his head up from his pillow. Are you listening to me? You may be here this morning, 14, 15, 18, 19, 25 years old. You think you're stout. You think you're healthy. You think you've got a lot of years ahead of you. I'm going to tell you, there's burning a lot of kids across America this morning. Just because you're young does not mean that you're not going to eternity. Let me tell you something. That boy was laying his head on his pillow, breathing, and all of a sudden, boom, in hell. Nobody had a chance to say, repent. Nobody said that a chance to say, get right. Boom, he was in hell. He saw that you will be in hell suddenly. The Bible said, He that hardeneth his heart, 
The Bible said, with, and there's no written Proverbs chapter 29, He that being often reproved and hardened his heart shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. That's what the Bible said. Can I tell you something further? There are people who are rejecting God and go right off. They'll say, you can send away your day of grace. You can piddle with God till it's over with and you're a dead man walking. You're a dead man walking. You're already in hell. You ain't got there yet. You listen to this one to number one. He saw that it was a reality. Number two, he saw that he could get there suddenly. But further than that, he saw when he got there that those old fundamentalist Bible banging preachers were right. It was a place of flames. Look with me if you will in chapter 16. It said there, Send Lazarus that it may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented hell. In this flame, listen to me, hell is a place of flames. He was so thirsty, he said, send somebody, send somebody to dip the tip of their finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in these flames. That's torment. You sat there this morning, and you were, all you're thinking about is eating your big, filling your gut with your food this afternoon. I'm going to tell you, it's going to be a day when you're going to put the fork in your mouth the last time. There's going to be a day when you tie your shoe the last time. When you button your shirt the last time. I'm going to tell you, it's going to be the last time you watch it. Drink your cold beer, the last time you drink your pop, and the last time you ever take a drink of water. And you're going to be in hell realizing that the Bible was right on the Lord. God spoke it, God said it, God created it, God made it, God knows. I don't care what these liberal, worthless bunch of devilish preachers think about in this country that ain't preaching on hell and don't believe in hell. They're liars. Say it's a pitiful shame you talk about compassion, Donnie. I'll tell you that the worst, the most incompassionate, uncompassionate people I know of in the world are people who are preaching behind prophets. And won't warn people there's a hell. And daddies and mamas who won't tell their kids, listen, there's a hell. There's a hell. Don't go there. Jesus died that you don't have to go to hell. God is a God of love, but God's a God of wrath. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see God, but the wrath of God abideth on him, the Bible said. Flee from the wrath of God, the Bible said. Not only did he see it was reality. Not only did he see was suddenly, not only did he see was a place of flames and torment and thirst, but I will say, listen to me, the, the, this world denies the, either denies the existence of hell or it redefines hell. Hell is what the Bible said it is. Let me say forth this morning that he saw the place where he needed mercy. Have mercy upon me, he said. Have mercy upon me. I want to ask you a question this morning. You claim to be saved? You think you're saved? When did you ever ask God for mercy? When did you ever ask God? I didn't say, when did you repeat a prayer with a preacher? I didn't say, when did you go through some shake somebody's hand? I didn't say, when did you get baptized? I said, when have you ever bowed your knees before God and said, God, be merciful to be a sinner? God, I need mercy. I can't save myself. I'm guilty. I'm wicked. I ought to be in hell. But God, I want mercy. When did you ever do that? When did you ever do that? That's why our country is full of false prophets. Don't know anything about God. All they know is their denominational lingo and line. Sickest thing I've ever seen in my life. Man told me this morning, a preacher told me. He said, Reggie, listen to me. I'll never, I'll just quote what another preacher said. He said, the biggest mission field in America is the Southern Baptist denomination. He said, the Southern Baptist churches are more full of lost people than any place you'll ever go to in America. Baptized. Hellbound, unconverted, unrepentant, never cried out for mercy to God. Who do you think we are? You know what? I get up here preaching. I'm not ashamed to get on my knees. I dare you to get on your knees. When you, when's the last time you get on your face before God? You think you're something? Let me tell you what you are. You're a worthless, sorry, low-down, hell-deserving piece of trash. That if it wasn't for God's mercy, you'd been in hell already. You're not good. Don't you tell me how good you are. You're not walking up big preaching. You say, well, what do you think you are? I should have been in hell. I say I should have been in hell. I'm telling you this morning, listen, we serve a God who is a merciful God, but He's a just God and a holy God, and He will send you to hell if you don't get converted. Not only did He see He was in hell, it was a reality that there was flames and torment and thirst, no, but He saw His need for mercy. 
Now I'll tell you something else. He got humble in hell. Never in his lifetime before. Never in his lifetime before had he asked for mercy about anything toward anybody. Never did he act like he was only fair and selflessly. Did you know something? Listen to me this morning. You can look at it and say, well, that's that rich man. Can I tell you that the average American lives better than the rich man lived? Yeah. The average American lives better than the rich man lived. We're fair and sumptuously every day. Our, go- our bellies have become our gods. Amen. Some of you are more concerned about your dinner than you are souls. That's how backslid you are. Some of you are more concerned about getting out at noon than you are about somebody burning in hell, screaming in hell. So that's, how, that's how spiritual you are. Some of you are more concerned about your appearances on the outside than you are about somebody dying and going to hell. I tell you what, I'm sick of this country. This country is under the judgment of God. This country is under the damnation of God. I want to tell you something. This country had light. This country had a Bible. This country is not reading this Bible. And church houses are full of people who are unconverted religious idiots. I'm saying to you this morning, I actually say, why? Because they have a knowledge of the form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Not only did he see his need for humility, but he see this. You get saved on this side of the grave, but you don't get saved at all. Amen. Did you notice know something about that passage of Scripture? Not one time did he say, Hey, God, give me another chance. He knew it was over. I want to tell you something they're going to do one of these days. If the normal thing happens to you, they're going to roll you up here in a casket. Dead as a rock. Your body laying here, your spirit and soul gone. By the way, can I say something to you? Now, this will be good. This is Bible. You said, I don't understand that. I can't grab that. You just better fly the just shall live by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It doesn't come by Dr. Spock. It comes by this book. Hey, listen to me. The Bible said he was buried, but he in hell lifted up his eyes. Your body is all that goes in the grave. Are you listening to me? That's all that goes in the grave is your body. Your spirit and your soul goes into eternity. If you're saved to be absent from the body, the Bible said for the Christian, is to be present with the Lord. Listen to me. Can I just back up and say something? It ain't just the Southern Baptists. It's every, it's every church in this country, every name tag in this country. He was, he, was, he was the Southern Baptist preacher. He just told me that himself. Okay, so he had authority to say that. I don't. That's what he said. I just say this the same way across the country. I don't care what the name tag is. But I'm saying this to you this morning, that your body is all that goes in the ground. Your spirit and your soul. You say, well, I understand that. According to Scripture, you have a soulish body that is able to feel, think, remember, touch, taste. According to that passage of Scripture. Now, let me just say something to you. If you don't believe that, what you're doing is calling Jesus Christ a liar. That's Jesus. Give us this story. Give us this account. You say, well, I think it's a parable. Oh, you do, do you? You really think a certain man is a parable? You know why you believe it's a parable? Because you read some idiot that wrote a book that don't like God. You didn't figure that out on yourself. You know, most preachers that call me up or write me and want to argue about stuff, they didn't come up with it on their own. They came up with it with somebody, you know, they heard somewhere. Yeah. I'm saying this to you. Listen. He realized that when you die, you are not going to get another chance to get saved. What, can you imagine dying? Can you imagine dying? And you're going to, can you imagine dying? And you pop into hell and you wake up, oh my God, I'm in hell! But that's the worst. That's not the worst. The worst of it is realization. I will never, never, never get out of here. I will never have another chance. You some makes me. You somebody said, Reggie, why do you preach against Catholicism so bad? I'll tell you one reason. Purgatory is one reason. Them stinking priests, them stinking bunch of liars, telling people that they can say mass and pay money to get their loved ones out of hell. If that's not the worst kind of extortionist bunch of junk I've ever heard tell of in my life, that's why I don't want to, that's why I will not be on a ministerial alliance with a priest. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Anybody that tells you you get saved after you die, they're lying to you. He saw when he got to hell, that was it. No more chances. How shall we escape, the Bible said, if we neglect so great a salvation? Not only did he see that he, after death, it was over. He saw the need to repent. The need to repent. Now you listen to me. The goodness of God is what will lead you to repentance. And repentance is what's missing in conversions in America today. We're religious as billy goats. Mean as the devil. Can I tell you something I've learned? I've learned something over the years. Donnie and my brother. Okay, I'm going to use an example. 
Me and Don's been brothers for as long as I've been alive. We're going to be brothers for eternity. You listen to me? Don and I have done a lot of things together. We've had some wonderful times. We've had some good times. We've had some tough times. We've had times we got into it. But I want to tell you how I know he's converted. John, you know what I'm getting ready to say? You know how I know he's converted? When God deals with him about a sin, he'll repent of it. Yeah. You listen to me. Now, I don't know you all as well as I know Donnie. I had a lot of dealings with Donnie. I'm going to tell you how I know I'm saved. The Spirit itself bears witness my spirit that I'm a child of God. Let me tell you something about it. Let me tell you something about a man that's been converted, Kenny. He will have a repentant heart, not just when he got saved. He'll have a repentant heart later. And let me tell you something. When you've done people wrong, and you will not repent of it, you're giving evidence you don't even know what it is to be saved. Are you listening to me? What's wrong with Christians who will not repent of their sin? Either. That's right. They have not the spirit of repentance in them. This man said, they will repent. He understood that repentance was necessary to be converted. The rich man in hell saw it when he got there. I wonder if you see it this morning. It bothers me. People do people dirty, low down, stinking. I mean, right in church. Slash! Twice try to hurt and destroy the work of God. Will not repent of it. I've saw more of it. I, I'm over 29 years preaching this pulpit. I, it, it's happened over and over and over again. You know what the Bible said? They're like wandering stars. Reserve the blackness forever. The Bible, the Bible will tell you what you are in a quick hurry. I'm going to tell you something. He saw the need to repent. Have you ever repented? Let me tell you what the repentance, the old timers used to say, is a deep return of the soul to God. It's where you're no longer talking about any goodness within you. I mean, tell you what, the Holy Ghost of God has moved within your spirit and is doing the work that turns you from wickedness and sin and religion and all that self-righteous garbage and turns you to the Savior and turns you to repent of your sin and gives you grace of the grace of God to turn and stop it. Some of you in this building this morning, you're going to be in hell if you don't repent. I mean, right in this building this morning, you are going to hell if you don't repent. And I love you enough to tell you. I love you enough to tell you. Talk about compassion. I'll tell you why we're not a compassionate people in America anymore, because we're not telling people they're going to hell. We're not telling people they need to repent. We're not even telling our own kids, much less our neighbors. Not only did he see that he needed to be saved now, that he needed to repent, and that there was no escape, but he saw that it was forever. The man asked about eternal punishment in the phone call this week. Let me tell you something. If, if you go to hell and you just burn up, then why does it say there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth? That don't sound like anybody just burned up to me. Why does it say, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night? No rest day nor night? They're not burned up and annihilated. Somebody's annihilated and weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth. And when Jesus gave this story, he didn't give a story about somebody annihilated. This man was weeping. He was crying out, have mercy, do something, have to give me some water. It's the reality. Then he saw this, that he remembered. I think of all the things that could happen to a man to go to hell. You're going to remember this Sunday you sat in this church. Now, you may hate my guts. I want to tell you something. You say, man, you preach to me and I don't like you. I don't like your looks. I don't, well, I don't like your expression. I don't like your attitude. That's all right. It's okay. I'm just no rough piece of wood that God called to preach. You tell God about you don't like me, would you? Just, you just go tell God you don't like me. But can I ask you to do something this morning? Can I just evaporate behind this pulpit and would you just not look at me anymore? Because you see, the judgment's not going to be about me. It's going to be about you and the Lord. And sometimes God, I'm going to tell you, can I give you a little something? Please listen to me. You read the Old Testament prophets, Jim, you know I'm telling you the truth. I know you love them old prophets. Them people hated them prophets, Jim. They hated their guts because they told them the truth. And they would kill them and tear them to pieces and put them in the lions and, 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 and assassinate them and murder them. And they, they would stop up their ears. And when Stephen came and preached to them, they ran upon him and gnashed upon him with their teeth. It has always been that an unrepentant people hate the man of God that preaches the Word of God. Let me tell you something about Bill Meyer. He hates Christianity. MSNBC, CNN, those people mock and they hate Christianity. 
I'm saying to you this morning, I wonder where you're at. Why is it you hate the man of God and dislike the man of God? Why do you have the attitude you have toward a man of God trying to tell you to repent and be saved, but you don't have that attitude toward a rock and roll star? You don't have that attitude toward some country western music star. You know why? Because he's greasing your slide to hell. Greasing your slide to hell. He remembered. He could feel. You remember this. It's why I don't understand how a person could hurt and be in torment and fear and thirst for eternity. I don't either. But I'm not God. I didn't write the book. God did. Can I say something to you? Most of the folks, no, no, everybody will say they believe heaven's forever. I don't know a liberal theologian that don't believe heaven's forever. But somehow or another, they're having problems believing hell is forever. And it's real. He had a conscience. Can I say something to you? When he got to hell, he saw something everybody needs to see. He saw that he was not really rich. He wasn't really rich. I'm going to tell you something. Materialism eating us up in this country, ain't it? <clears throat> It's eating us up. All our lives are about, it seems like us. You know, what we can grab, get a hold of, accumulate, you know, have. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What profit does a man gain the whole world, lose his own soul? You know why? Can I tell you something? You know why a bunch of you boys in this church ain't going out to the ministry and you ain't preaching? It ain't because God ain't calling people. I don't believe that. Maybe, maybe the greatest sin I've ever committed is materialism, as an example. But I can tell you what will keep us from serving God, and that's making money. And God said no man can serve two masters. You'll either serve God or you'll serve money, you'll serve money, but you won't serve both of them. I'll tell you, he saw when he got to hell that he wasn't really rich. And I'll tell you what I'd rather do this morning. I thank God God's been so good to me and my family. But Philip, I'll be honest with you, I'd rather be homeless this morning and be saved than to have our house and be lost. I've had to wrestle with that over time. You know, I've had to let you know thing because <clears throat> I got I've got news for you. Them them prosperity preachers are lying to you. Watch this verse. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? When he got to hell, he saw that that house and that car and that truck and that four-wheeler and that boat and all that CDs and all that junk did not make him a rich man. The Bible talks about riches. They'll pierce you through with many sorrows. They'll fly away as wings. And we're not to trust in them. He saw not only that, but he saw devils. Now, listen to me this morning. One of the most atrocious, most, most trembling things that I've ever dealt with in my life in reading the Bible and preaching is the fact that I'm preaching to people who, if they don't get saved, they're going to die and go to hell, and they're going to be where devils are. Have you ever read the description of, of the beast in hell in the book of Revelation? Have you ever read what's coming out of the heart of the earth during the tribulation period, the beast that will come out? Well, folks, I'm talking about when you go to hell! All of a sudden, you will be down in the midst of those creatures. I believe, personally, that much of the torment, if you'll find out the word torment is repeatedly mentioned by this man's mouth, tormented, tormented, I'm tormented, I'm tormented. I believe that his torment was much caused by the devils in hell, those creatures in hell. The Bible said that the tails had heads on them like serpents, and with them they do bite and sting. Can you imagine the hideous, hellish-looking creatures that would come up to you in hell? I'm talking, he saw some things when he got to hell. He wouldn't believe the Bible. He wouldn't believe the preachers in him. Now, I'll give him tell you one thing. You'll believe it when you get there. You say, I'll go to hell and drink with my buddies. No, you won't. I'll go to hell and play cards with my buddies. Let me tell you something. Let me tell some of you little half-cocked, wimpy teenagers that have got the stupid music out there in your trucks and cars. You better listen to it real good now. Because when you pop into hell, you're not going to hear Madonna no more. You're not going to hear Lady Gaga another time. So bust your ears out, sister. Bust your ears out, buddy. And get your Christian rock and roll and listen to the socks off of it. Because you'll never listen to it in hell. 
You'll never listen to it in hell. I'm telling you this this morning, folks. It's like a slow glaze going over our eyes in this country. Some of you hadn't thought about hell in five weeks. No wonder you're not motivated to do anything for God. He saw in hell the doomed and the damned. I'll tell you something I'll never forget. I don't care what you think about it, but Dr. J. Vernon McGee said one time, a man said to him, he said, I can't think of anything that would be worse than going to hell. J. Vernon McGee said, I can. And he said, that is hearing the screams of my own children having followed me there. I want to ask you something. Are you saved? And are your children saved? Let me tell you about myself. When I was 28 years old, the night I got saved, Frankie, there's a fear of God come over me, and that's what's missing with people. They don't fear God. They've heard so much God has loved, goosey, goosey, bunch of nonsense. They don't fear God. But I'll tell you, the fear of God fell on me that night. That's what hit me. That's why the Holy Ghost has to come upon you. You see, it's not my hollering and not my preaching, but when the Holy Ghost comes and visits you. And I'm so grateful that night that the Spirit of the living God came upon me with the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. And I'm going to tell you something. I made up my mind that night. I wasn't, I wasn't going to hell. I didn't care what my daddy thought. I didn't care what my mama thought. I didn't care what my brothers thought. I didn't care what the neighbors thought. I didn't care what all the people in the country that I had sold sales for and sold to. I didn't care what those people thought anymore. I'm not going to hell over anybody else's pride. Much less my own. He saw the doomed. I wonder who you'll see in hell. He saw that it was a place of weeping. I'll never forget my first funeral I remember going to. I, I'll never forget as long as I lived. I'm Oak Forest Church. I was just a little rascal. I don't even remember whose funeral it was. All I remember on the woman that was, whose husband had died had a polka dot blue dress on. I remember that much. But I'll tell you what I do remember. I remember they had everybody going outside the church. And I was a little boy standing out there by that old porch. Had my arm around that old porch pillar. Had a little kid would do. I, kinda, I was kind of inquisitive, you know. I hadn't been around. I didn't know what's going on hardly. I didn't understand death, what's happening. I remember looking back in that room and boy, all of a sudden, oh! and I saw that woman fall on that casket. I saw her grab the body of that husband. <laughs> and I thought about that a lot of times. That's what you'll hear in hell. Weeping, wailing. Can you imagine gnashing your teeth? You're in such pain that you're popping and gnashing your teeth. That's what you'll see when you get into hell. I want to encourage you today this. If you're lost today, there's some things I want you to see. He saw that there were devils, that he was damned, and he saw the doomed. He saw the weeping, the gnashing of teeth. But I believe he saw this. And I'll tell you why. Abraham told him, he said, he said, I want you to send him back to my brothers. He saw he should have been a soul winner and he should have been burdened. Can you imagine, here's a guy who lived sumptuously all his life, had five brothers out here. Now all of a sudden he wants somebody to go witness to him. There's an old song. When in... A better land before the throne we stand. How deeply grieved our souls may be. If any lost one there should cry out in deep despair. You never mentioned Jesus to me. You never mentioned Jesus to me, and you helped me not the light to see. You met me day by day, and you knew I was astray. Yet you never mentioned Jesus to me. This week, I went to book a sale. I walked in there. Kitchen dining room of that house, and the lady said to me, she said, can you tell me who that is, Reggie? She said, I think it's so-and-so, and I don't know, that don't ring right. It was an artist's conception of a person, a person had drawn, pencil drawing in a person. 
And all of a sudden I realized who it was, and I told her. She said, you're right, that's who that is. You know what I thought of this week? The Lord has been dealing with me about preaching this for about three weeks. I worked with that man for several years. And to my knowledge, Philip, I never set him down. And I never said, listen, if you'd have died today, where would you be? Where would you go, heaven or hell? Could I tell you about what Jesus did for you? And you know what that man did, Daddy? About a year ago, he fell over dead with a heart attack just that fast. And God spoke to me this week. He said, Reggie, of all those years you worked in and around that man that was by him and around him, you never, ever witnessed that man one time. I had to ask God to forgive me. That old song come back to my heart. You never mentioned Jesus to me. Listen, every, every service can't be a joke and a laugh and a hee-haw service. For people are dying and going to hell. I want to ask you this morning, do you see hell? Do you see the reality of it? Do you see the suddenness of it? Do you see the pain of it, the misery of it? Somebody said if you could, if you could if you'd go to hell and find an exit place, you'd have the largest crowd in the world. You know you'll be unwelcome in hell. You'll be tormented by beasts in hell. <clears throat> you'll want to die and cannot die. You'll thirst in hell. There'll be no TV in hell. There'll be no Internet in hell. <clears throat> There'll be no texting in hell. There'll be no cell phones in hell. There'll be no Facebook in hell. There'll be no music in hell except the weeping and wailing of the damned. There'll be no rock and roll. There'll be no country western. There'll be no cold beer. There'll be no pop. You don't like the Bible? There'll be no Bibles in hell. You don't like preaching? There'll be no preaching in hell. You don't walk like the songs of Zion? There'll be no songs of Zion in hell. There'll be no brethren in hell. No fresh air in hell. No water. You, there's no place to go. Some of you just can't hardly stand to get out in this heat. My soul, you don't have an idea what heat is. The Bible says this, and I close. It's a place of everlasting punishment. It's a place where the fire is not quenched. It's a place where the inhabitants have no rest day nor night. It is a place where the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. It is a bottomless pit. It is a place of outer darkness. It is a lake of fire after the judgment, the great white throne judgment. It's a place of torments. It's a place of no mercy. It's a place of no water. It's a place of fire and brimstone. It's a place of no Bibles, no gospel tracts, no preachers, no love, no peace, no joy. It's a place of fright. Flames. It's a place of loneliness and separation. It's a place of remembering. And it's a place of gnashing of teeth. It is a place of demons. It is called a furnace of fire. It is an everlasting destruction. And you can't get drunk and forget about it. You can't dope head and shoot yourself up and take enough drugs to, to get your mind away from it. It's a place of torment. And it's a place of eternity. I want us to Stand together with our heads bowed this morning. As the pianist comes and Van comes with a song. <clears throat> I'm serious as death now. I'm not worried about dinner. I want every head bowed, every eye closed in this building. I want people that love God or say praying for those that are lost. I'm going to ask you a question this morning as serious as eternity. If you died today, if you died today, where would you be? Honest to goodness. You can fool yourself. That's the worst kind of deception. You can fool me. You've done nothing. But you'll never fool God. I want to ask you homeschool kids, you Christian school kids. I want to ask you families. Let me tell you something. There's people lost in this building today. You can't tell me that God burdened my heart all week long to preach this message and for not. I want to ask you something today. I want to ask you a real serious question. Does the Spirit of God bear witness with your spirit that you're saved? Have you been born again of the Spirit of God? Ask yourself that question. If you were to die right now, are you honest to goodness, ready to meet the Lord? Are you ready? If you know for a fact that you're ready, I'm going to ask you to lift a hand toward heaven and thank God Almighty for His mercy. Verbally thank Him. God, thank you for saving me. Lord, thank you for saving me. Now, you may put them down. I'm going to ask you a question. You say you're saved. 
How many of you want to say, I'm living like it? I'm looking like it. I said earlier this morning, we need to believe there's a hell. We need a burden about hell. And we need to be bold to tell other people there is a hell. Now I ask you this question. You're here and you could not raise your hand. But you're lost and you'd like to be saved. I want to tell you something. Whether you believe it or not, I'm your friend. But I'm not nothing the friend Jesus is to you. And your only hope is Jesus Christ. And what you've got to do is repent of your sin. You have, that means a godly sorrow for your sins. I'm talking about a turn in your soul from Satan and self and this world to God. You're lost, but you don't want to be lost. And you need to be saved, and you know you need to be saved, and you'd appreciate prayer. I want to pray for you before we give this invitation. Would you slip your hand up quick and, quick and high so I know how to pray for you? Right up quick. Up in the air. I'm lost without God, and I need Christ. I need Christ. Anywhere in this building. Anywhere in this building. I want to ask you a question. Are you religious but lost? Is there the witness of the Spirit within your heart? Does, does repentance show itself in your soul? Or do you rationalize and justify everything that goes on? Your wickedness. Is there a lost man, boy, or girl in this building this morning that said, Pastor, pray for me? Any word? We're going to sing a song, Van. If you feel a need to come and be saved today, you come. If you feel a need today to have a burden, you've got a burden. Oh, God, give me back my burden for the lost. Help me to have my eyes open to see the realities of eternity. You just do business with God as they sing this morning. Are your children dying and going to hell? When's the last time you poured your heart out to God? Have you been honest with yourself about it? Would you come? Are you saved today? Are you going to hell? Are you dying and going to hell? You say, oh, you're just an old Bible-banging, fire, hellfire and brimstone preacher. You got it. You're right. And it's no laughing matter. I don't know what God wants to do with this message. All I'm just a mailman. I'll tell you one thing. There's millions of people underneath your feet that would love to have the opportunity that you have this morning to be saved, to know the Lord, to have their sins forgiven. You know why people don't think they need to be saved anymore? Because they don't think they're sinners. And they compare themselves among themselves. The Bible said you're not wise to do that. If you're not wise, it's stupid. Because it's not your comparison to other people. It's to the Lord Jesus Christ and to a holy God. And we're preaching a gospel for sinners. I don't have any good news for the self-righteous crowd. If you're self-righteous and think you're a good person, I have no good news for you. You're self-righteous, and until you break from that and see yourself as an unworthy sinner needing saved, but then I'll have good news for you. Christ died for you. He died for your sins. Would you come? I'm asking you today. Are you too proud? That's what's going to send you straight to hell. You're so proud you wouldn't come and you wouldn't kneel, you wouldn't bow. That's what's going to send you straight to hell. You say, oh, I just want to be saved at your house. I hope you do, but I doubt you will. What's happened to America? We're so proud that we can't publicly. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me and of my gospel, I'll be ashamed of you. I'm before my Father. Anybody else this morning need to do any business with God? If everybody would just this morning, just, just I want to ask you reverently, would you bow your head just in reverence before the Lord and reverence to this service, what God's trying to do? Is there just one soul here today? Listen, I know many of you people. You've prayed, you've witnessed, you've given tracts, you've fasted, you've done all you know to do for your loved ones. And I, I thank God for you. I thank you for your example to me. But I tell you, my heart is burdened today. I believe the Lord's coming. I do. I believe the Lord's coming back soon. But if He doesn't come back, you know what? You're going to die. And I don't want people that attended this church to go out into eternity lost. 
One more time before we dismiss this service, I'm going to ask you. Is there a soul in this place say, I am lost. I'm going to be honest about it. I'm lost. And I need prayer. And you'd raise your hand, Pastor. Now listen, I ain't going to come back and aggravate you. Listen, if the Holy Ghost doesn't bring you to Christ, I can't. But I want to pray for you because prayer is powerful. You need prayer. Is there a hand in this building, Pastor? God had this message for me. Pray for me today. I'm not really saved. Anywhere in this building, up high, God have mercy on us. God have mercy upon us. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray today that you'll take the message and do what needs to be done with it in every heart. God, don't let us forget there's a hell beneath us, lost folk around us, but there's a Savior above us and in us. And God, I want to ask you, Lord, that you wouldn't let me get by without having a burden. I'm asking you, Lord, for the burden. Help me to see people as they really are. Give me the grace and the love and the boldness to witness to people in a gracious way, to warn people, Heavenly Father. Help me, God, to care about people out here on the day-by-day basis that I meet and see. Lord, help us as a church, Lord, to win people to Christ. God, help us to be the salt and the light that we ought to be. Oh, God, help us to see out into eternity today. Lord, I tell you, it just breaks, it just grieves my heart. Lord, it just seems like the whole nation is just floating on a, on a piece of log, a rotten log going off over the cliffs of hell. God, help us, I pray. Lord, bless camp this week, I pray, oh God. Pour your spirit out upon that place. May the power of God rest upon it and move the saving of souls. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed as you are. Thank you so much for being here. We'll see you tonight, Lord willing.